Discouragement, fear, failure. Only a few years ago, these stalked the nation. Depression haunted America. We groped. We struggled, we found the way to better times. Today, depression is a fading memory. Millions of men and women have found employment and with it, confidence and hope. The program has removed a vast army from relief roles. It revived lagging industry, restored morale, and renewed courage. In a program which covers the entire nation, West Virginia takes an important place. A project employing thousands of workers is the improvement of almost 3,500 miles of secondary and of so-called creek and hollow roads, which follow the natural contours of the land. Roads once impassable in bad weather are now good the year round, allowing the people of formerly inaccessible mountain communities to get to market centers and giving tourists, hunters and fishermen access to the beautiful streams and forests of the Alleghenies. In projects such as this and in the great construction program throughout the state, we find assurance that we are building a strong foundation for a better West Virginia. Nineteen thirty-nine. Traveling through the beautiful Tiber Valley, we come upon an example of Eleanor Roosevelt's hope for a civil society. The beautifully built Cape Cod style houses are complete with hot and cold running water, an indoor bathroom all situated on between 1.5 and 2 acres of lawn. To achieve the goals of self-sufficiency, the United States government has poured over $675,000 on the West Virginia Project alone. The Tiger Valley Homestead is the newest and largest of the West Virginia homesteads. The Tiger Valley Homestead School, recently completed, is the crown jewel of the Tiger Valley Homesteads. Housing, nine grades, children are taught academic subjects often through a combination of lecture, reading, and experience. One example is by teaching students the world and other cultures, for example, through the Maypole Dance. Oh yes, yeah, the Maypole dance was one of the favorites. Um, it seemed like that was an activity that all the kids could do. Of course, we took turns, but everybody was interested, everybody had a good time, and um, it was fun, fun activity. Did you, do you remember, did your class do the Maypole dance? Did you have the Maypole? Yes, I remember that, but I, I wasn't in it. But they did one, huh? Yeah. Well, they should have had you in it. You were there. Well, I might have been <laughs> so long. So, so long. I don't know whether my first day was May Day or not. I know we came here in May. And, of course, on May Day, they had a big whole school celebration in the gym. And they had the, I guess, maybe volleyball host. And they had ribbons down. And the whole class had already practiced, and they, they did it by couples. And a girl was with a boy, and they knew, you know, they were winding in and out and doing the maypole dance. 
dressed up, you bought a real nice fancy dress and had your hair all fixed. And they had this big pole in the gym and they had strings up there and you went in and out and in and out and rattled that around that pole. It was called the Maypole Dance and it was done in May every year. In the gym, and I barely remember anything about that except the ribbons, I always said, was crepe paper and you said... It was. Was it? Yeah, it was crepe paper. How did we not destroy it at Well, the time? we did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember weaving, the kids weaving in and out, but I don't think I was part of that. We need to find out if that pole is still here and if we ever have, well, when we have an open house, we have that May Day pole. We can use the volleyball pole. <laughs> I don't even know how tall it was. Yeah, I don't either. I don't it had know. to have been pretty tall. We had May pole dancing out here. And Did I got to do that. Outside? And when I lived over in East Daly, I came over for the May dance, May pole dance and it was held inside, and I was really disappointed because it was really nice out there in the field. So you had it out mm -hmm. Out in the field, yeah. Have you heard of the May Day poll we had here? It was wonderful. I think it, it was, was crepe paper, was paper, that, paper that, that we used. Yeah. And when, we, when you got through, the poll was covered with crepe paper in all different colors. Uh, each uh, class did a different, different dance, and uh, then, uh, I think it was the, the either the fifth or sixth graders. They always did the maypole dance, where you went under and over and held onto the strings and wove all the the streamers down around the around the pole. That's cool. Did the parents come to that? That, that was a big function. Yeah, oh. that, that was that was that was a big participation in that. special time in life to be here. We were probably upper lower class and didn't know it or lower middle class or whatever, but everybody was pretty much the same. We all came from the local school, local houses here, you know. There was no, there was no uh, trailer park over here at that time, right. you know, and there weren't a lot of trailers probably being made at that time, so it was mainly homestead houses that we all came from and they were just little five room houses, but people kept them up. Cap, who came from Pickens, told us about buying his home. And we paid, what, for twelve twenty three, I believe I paid a month, rent, wasn't it? Half of that I went think. on the house, wasn't it? No, and we had them credit hours that held off of us, see. Tell me about the credit hours. What did they take? Uh, we got paid for four days or three? Three, three days and, uh, and uh, two days credit hours. We ask how he felt about the decision to come here. Well, just like I told you down there at the road, I don't think, I probably maybe never would have had a home. Anyhow, near as good as this one if I hadn't come over here, I mean. Ole Tuning up here told me a few years ago, Lord, Lord, he said, I'm glad you talked me a notion of signing up for one of them <laughs> things and come over here. <laughs> My dad and mom moved in uh, the homestead over there in 1935. In fact, they was, we lived up on what they called Watt C. It was A, B, and C, and we lived on the C. And I think we were the first family. My dad was a carpenter. He helped build the houses. So I think he went over there and worked on our house at night himself. So we got it. It was finished before any others on Watt C was finished. So we got to move in early. This is the blueprint of uh, Watt C, C19. It was the last house built and it belonged to my grandparents, uh, Jess and Emma Welch. Okay. So, and it's in East Stanley. This blueprint is dated April 13, 1938. This is the print of the whole lot. It contained 1.983 acres. Um, this shows the house. It was Plan 14. It had three bedrooms up and one down, uh, a porch on the front and a small porch on the back. Then this was the outbuildings, and it says it was type 51, but most of those were, they were situated different, some different, so apparently there was a little bit difference to each one of those two. This shows the main highway, the county road, and uh, the driveway. It shows the water lines, the electric lines, everything that was put in when the house was built. Yeah, we had two two bedrooms upstairs and downstairs we had a bedroom and living room kitchen basics we lived in east daly 
our house was the last house to be completed. Okay. It, it was the dormitory of, that housed the workers that built the homesteads, and uh, it burned down. And so our house was the last house to be built on the homesteads. Do you remember it what was it was? C-19. C-19. Families all got along well, and, and all the families had, most of the families had like four or five kids, you know. So there's big families, and, and the kids used to get together, you know, and play games of the evening whenever we wasn't working in the garden or something. I remember uh, a, a wedding, a wedding ceremony when anyone got married on the, and this was over in East Daly though. Uh, anybody that got married, we serenaded them, and the men would have the would have to put his bride in the wheelbarrow and wheel her around the uh, area and go down. There was a, the overhand bridge wasn't there. It was just a submarine bridge. And I understand that it's partially there. It's, you know, just concrete. It's probably not some of it's washed away. But yeah. he would, the, a groom would wheel that his bride down in the wheelbarrow and dump her in the water. <laughs> and uh, then we got to smoke cigars. That's the only time that I ever got to smoke. And it was a cigar. And we had a cart. Our family had a cart. It was pretty good size. Had two big wheels on the back and a little tongue in the front with two small wheels in the front. And Mm -hmm. We had people that was designated to be the uh, operator of that cart, and he sat on the tongue of that <laughs> cart with his feet up on the, you know, and that's how he could steer that cart, you know, with his feet. Wow. And all the kids on the homestead, we all gathered and pushed that cart up the hills, and then everybody jumped on the cart and rode down. <laughs> no, no it danger. Was it, was, it was a lot of fun. Oh, man. You know, so that's, what our, that's what our excitement that we had. Yeah, well, another excitement we had, too, was Dad had a sled, and he always had a horse, because we did plowing with it and stuff, you know, and cultivating. And, and Dad would hook that sled up in the wintertime and drive it around East Daly, and all the kids that lived there would come running out, and he always had a full sled, and there would be kids running along the side of it waiting for their turn, you know, and you'd have to make somebody get off so he could get back and get on. But that was fun. They used to have square dances there. They used to have a lot of uh, uh, shoot, shooting matches there. Uh, <coughs> they would... Uh, about every Saturday afternoon, there was a shooting match at the uh, at the Daly Park Pavilion, and uh, but the, that was a, a focal point. Of course, the uh, original pavilion was built by the CCCs, and uh, of course, it was built out of about probably 90% chestnut. Oh, I can remember when Uncle Warble when they finally made them buy the houses. And they wanted thirty-five hundred dollars, and Uncle Orwell was just a ranting and raving. He's a very quiet man, never complained hardly ever. But boy, now he thought that with three thousand dollars was a, an awful amount of money. Did he? He bought it though. But he bought it. Yeah, whether he liked it or not. <laughs> Did he have pigs and things? Did he have livestock there on his? Uh, across the road, you know where Wildwood is. Uh huh. Okay, there was a there's a hill there. And there was this uh, path went up through there, and they had barns, and uh, that's where we kept the livestock and the hogs. So we'd have to go up there and uh, feed the hogs once or twice a day, and, and of course she milked the cow, and that's where we picked all the blackberries and blueberries. It was all on that hill right there, wow. across the road. See this bush? Yeah. And right straight through there. Yeah. Uh, my mom taught me how to to, to milk a, milk a cow. Yeah. <laughs> you have cows out here? Right straight through there. Uh -huh. And 
up here, the, the bear is <laughs> over there, and she said, now Ev, she called me Ev, <laughs> she said, you go to uh, get the huckleberries. We had the ducks laid eggs along the little bank, and uh, we collected the duck eggs and ate those. Wow. Didn't waste any. No, though. no, there was no waste to anything. And if we well, did have anything left over, the pigs got it. Uh, now, the house that I lived in on the farm was not an original homestead house, but before I was born, they were uh, one of the original homesteaders uh, on Bradley Road in Valley Bend. And my dad had milk cows, and uh, he sold milk in Daly and Valley Bend, the East Daly area. And he had uh, chickens and pigs and uh, pretty much a general farm uh, atmosphere. My mom's, my, my mom's sister, Ethel, uh, she married Cecil Rosencrantz and my mom married John Rosencrantz. They were cousins. So I was related on both sides. Cecil and my, my Aunt Ethel were original homesteaders at Daly. And Uncle Cecil built, or helped build, many of the homes. He never even owned a car, so he just walked to work every day. So when my parents bought the house in Valley Bend, they, this, they were, I think, the third owners. Uh, I think there was a shoe, and then they bought it from Swecker. Her husband had been killed in the coal mines, and she had several children, and they were moving away. So my parents uh, bought the home in, in May of 1959. And uh, <laughs> they paid, I don't know, like $8,500 for this three-acre corner lot. My Aunt Ethel had a conniption fit. She said, what? You paid that much for a homestead house? That's ridiculous, you know. Of course, their home had probably been much cheaper because he built. I mean, he built, yeah, who knows what they say. But they were original homesteaders. But no, my parents were not. They were not. It was a community. I mean, everybody was the same socioeconomic background. and Everybody had the same goals in life. A lot of your time was spent surviving, and in the summertime you raised your, your gardens and you canned the vegetables, and uh, then lots of times in the fall they also buried turnips and some of your uh, produce from your garden. You buried it and covered it and then put it in straw, and then you dug it out later. It was uh, gave you another storage area and a way of preserving things. It was... Uh, uh, you know, it was a great place to, to grow up. It was uh, uh, taught you a lot about life and the thing of preparing. I mean, like from an early age, you knew what you uh, what you raised in the summer was what you were going to eat in the winter, and it went in the cellar, and you know that's what you had. And uh, you know, from potatoes to to beans, that's that's what you had. Everything, potatoes, tomatoes, corn, uh, carrots, radishes, beets, uh, cucumbers. Um, you raised it and you canned it for winter because you had your cellar. You raised all your own vegetables and then Dad had a, we would uh, either kill a pig or a beef, you know, and Mom would can some of it and then we had a freezer, you would freeze some, so. And she even used to make her own cottage cheese and her own butter. So, you know, you were kind of, you did, you had a lot of your stuff right there. But we raised all of our own yeah. food. Yeah. And the only time I remember them going to the store was to buy sugar and coffee and that type thing. But everything else we were self sufficient with. Mom canned, the cellar was always full of. Uh, uh, canned goods and the potato bins were always filled and he, uh, when the cabbage, he would uh, cover it with dirt, you know, yeah, and yeah. all we would have to do is go out and, and put the cabbage in this way and the, root, the roots were sticking out and just pull a, a head of cabbage out, uh, you know, it was buried. Oh. And we buried apples yeah. and pears. Along with Mom Cannon and yeah. everything. Yeah. So you had those all winter then? Yeah. Yes. Wow. We didn't, it was self sufficient. We referred to the back there as the back 40. That's my job to mow that right now. But 
I told my husband if we would just plow it up like my dad did, because he would have Andy Walmsley come over, and he would plow it up, and then my dad and I would go out there and plant things, and it was my job to go out there and weed, and occasionally he'd send me out there to pick tomatoes or pull up some onions for him, but he didn't like to do that too much. He said sometimes I pulled the wrong stuff. <laughs> It was kind of a co-op community because below the, the school and the house down there uh, on the hill next to the milk property, they had built a, a potato, a large potato bin for a co-op. Like, you know, if you grew potatoes, everybody everybody put it, put it in and then everybody could harvest from it, you know, That's, in, that in the neat. beginning. so. And they had two farmers who raised the potatoes and stored them yeah. for them. So I think that growing up, in that area and understanding the value of raising your own food and food preservation. You know, I later in life became a dietitian and I was in 4-H basically my whole life and it was kind of like my life was on this trajectory to study food and and understand what a role food had in lives in our lives and I guess that was kind of ingrained in me and I didn't know that growing up. You know, I knew there was a seller and I would go into my aunt's cellar and it was always kind of spooky and creepy, but I saw people who worked in the garden and had gardens and I did the same thing. And when I was in 4-H, I studied food. I always picked a food project to study or a cooking project. And I took extra home ec classes in high school and I always did food-based projects. And I think that had a really important role in, my, in the development of my career. It wasn't until much later in life that I've been able to look back and reflect on that and understand the role that that probably played in, in, in my develop, the development of my career. But it's now sort of come full circle. You know, as I'm um, working on my doctorate and, and teaching and working with community-based organizations to promote those same ideas of growing your own garden and food preservation and learning to can your foods and freeze foods so that you have fresh foods all the time. I have now been able to reflect on that and understand what an important role that has had in my personal development and also in my career growth. 4-H, 4-H was such a, a big part in, in Valley Bend, and I guess in Staley also, I'm not sure, each community. Valley Bend had a community house, a community building. It was on the left side of the Methodist Church. Oh, yeah. And, but it was called the community building. And anybody, that's where we had our 4-H meetings. You could rent it out as a birthday party. Um, the Methodist Church used it in the summer for vacation Bible school. Um, the fire hall in Valley Bend, um, they would take the fire engines out uh, sometimes in the summer and they would hold square dances wow. in the fire hall. And the adults were very accommodating for the kids to come and just take us right in to, and be a partner and, and learn the, to square dance. And just a, it's a wonderful place to grow up. The Homestead Project and the whole meaning behind it, having your garden, having a cellar, the home cooked foods. All of our meals were home prepared and they were uh, original home cooked food. And I remember our first stove was a um, wooden stove and it had four burners on it and it had a section that you heated water with and it had an oven. And of course it was heated by wood. So in the winter time that was fine. In the summertime you would burn up if you were cooking a meal. So everything was um, pretty much self-contained living on the homesteads. Even our hot water tank was hooked up to that uh, wood cook stove, which heated our water. Had us, there were sad arms, and uh, I think there was maybe four, I still three or four, do you? <laughs> yeah. uh, irons, you know, that sat on the back of the cook stove. And it had a little handle that the clips or you clicked on, and that's how you did the ironing. And when that when that iron got cool, you know, you just put it back on the stove and picked up another one that was hot. Oh, and you also had a cloth laying here that you cleaned that iron with before you yeah. ironed the yeah. shirt or anything. Yeah, the whites went one I'm, place in the shirt. I'm still put, I still hang out clothes on my line. Mm -hmm. I hang out my sheets and and blue jeans and things, and then yeah, all 
put them in the dryer, the blue jeans, you know, to soften them up a little bit. But I still hang out a lot of a lot of clothes, and I've had people that come down past my house and they say, you know, you're the only person that I ever see. Well, no one has clotheslines. Right. And he said, you're the only person that we ever see with clothes hanging on the line. But it goes back to mm -hmm, when we were how we were raised. Mom was real particular about hanging underwear out. Remember that? No, I don't remember you that. You didn't hang your panties out, you know, <laughs> and that was all private. Right. Yeah, where well you did one, and then you got the other piece, and you'd clip this one and this one together. And you had a hole. Yeah, and you hung your panties together, and the men's underwear together, and the sheets together, and the, the pillowcases together, the towels together. She would never let us use the washer. And um, her fear was our hair getting caught in those ringers. Um, but yeah, we would hang up the clothes. And they had to be done a certain way. Yeah. And clothes that had a stain on them had to be laid on the grass because the grass would take the stain out of the clothes. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Well, I'm going to try it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to remember laying stained clothes on top of the grass with a, with a stain facing down. These are the qualifications required in settlers for successful land settlement. This is from an analysis of methods and criteria used in selecting families for colonization projects. Number one, technical knowledge gained chiefly through experience of the type of agriculture to be practiced in the new farm settlement. Number two, a rudimentary education and as much additional education as is in harmony with a favorable attitude toward farm life. Three, cooperative and harmonious family life. A cooperative wife and children who want to live on and help with the farm and who have experienced agricultural life. Four, a size and age sex composition of the family that is adjusted to the size and type of farm. Five. There were 1,640 of them applied for the homes. They sent a government around to the homes, I know that. Because I can remember a man and a woman coming to our home in what they call Camel Town. Uh, that's where I lived before I moved here. You know where, over oh, on this side of Marlington, you know where Edry is? I do. Well, it's between Edry and Riverside. All right. And then Marlington. Now that's where, uh, they sent a man and a woman in over there to uh, check people out. Well, they went all over the state. Oh, okay. These, counties, these people here, my list shows them being born in different counties. Lewis, Harrison, Pendleton, Upshur. I guess it was pretty well statewide as to when they advertised that there would be, and, and then you had to apply, and then they checked you. Check, check your history and also your vocation, you know. That my, my thought was they picked people, a good complement of people that could work at the mill, you know, and do different things and support the community. And Not for, uh, not when they selected them. They were selecting the ones that weren't working. Most yeah, and, and they weren't, they weren't. Uh, so they weren't working. But they had well, uh, they had trades. Yeah. Uh, now my dad was working for the. I don't know if it was welfare. I never did find out. But he was working at Watoga State Park. Watoga State Park, largest in the state, located in picturesque Pocahontas County, is approached from one end by a ford and an old ferry, which are as familiar to some West Virginians as the Crossroads Store. I had to go to Beverly High. I didn't attend the homestead. No. But there was a uh, Nan McLaughlin from Pocahontas County. Yeah. Was a nurse and a uh, a print girl was a nurse. Were they paid by the government? They were paid by the government, and the government paid those doctors. 
and we even had a dentist, oh. a Dr. Overton, mm -hmm. and then a Dr. Bankhead was in the Trade Center. The originally, the, the drugstore was in where the post office is at now. Okay. And the little inset, back inset there was... The uh, drugstore is a post office now. Okay. And, and, and then the room beside of it... Used to be the post office when we were growing up where she worked. Yeah. Okay. But uh, before that it was... A barber, they had a barber shop. And then they had a store. A big store now that's been turned into, I think, an apartment. Yeah, it's all apartments now. I don't, uh, I am going in down there. What, was there and the next place was the um, hardware store, the Gibson Hardware Store. And then the restaurant. And then the restaurant, and there was, uh, up overhead there was a uh, Just a community center. big room that was for a meeting place. They had church or any activity they needed Yeah. over the trade center, restaurant park now. Mm -hmm. They voted well, up there and everything. Now. Wow. Yet yeah, today, I'm still kind of uh, uh, fascinated by the word trade center. You know, it was uh, simple, but that's what it was. I mean, that's where everybody went to do their trade and get what they needed. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you didn't get in your vehicle and, and go to Elkins. Uh, I mean, it was basically what you needed was there. Right. I mean, at Valley Bend, when I was growing up, there were uh, actually three grocery stores. It was Scott's store and Wilson Ferris's store, and then Stodd uh, had a small grocery store. And then gasoline, and that's where you got your gasoline. There was uh, gas pumps at uh, uh, Wilson Ferris's. There was gas pump at Scott's store. You see, my aunt and uncle went in there together, and it wasn't that big, and I think they didn't want the kids in there so much. Right. Because I can't remember hardly ever seeing another kid in there. I, I didn't go much, but uh, but they used that store. And like if they, uh, we had needed a loaf of bread, I had to ride my bicycle all the way daily to get a loaf of bread. She made bread most of the time, but Uncle Warble wanted that bakery bread at his lunch. Oh, he liked so, it. So, yeah. What about Willoughby's and the Dutch Oven Bakery? Yeah. Did you buy stuff from them too? Yeah, I'm, I worked at the bakery. You worked at the bakery too? Wow, that's great. Yeah. That, you must have had and, some. And let's see, another bakery I worked at. I made donuts and on down the street there, there was a bakery. And I, we had a little store in East Delhi. It was called Home Store. It wasn't a general store, but everybody in East Delhi went there because he had pop and milk and bread and candy and uh, cans of stuff like soup and whatever. And we would we would walk down there and, and pick up our things. And it was strange because candy was a penny up for a pack, like a little pack of kits. It was five pieces of candy for a penny. And a bottle of pop was a dime, and two cents for the glass bottle. When you brought the bottle back, you got your two cents back. And like a fudge sickle was a nickel. <laughs> An ice cream sandwich was a dime. I mean, these were, I mean, you know. And if you walked to the store, you always looked in the ditches on the way down to see if you found a glass pop bottle so you could get two cents to get more candy. There was a small farm my dad had. It pigs and cows and chickens and a horse and we raised rabbits and so we all he kept us all busy we did a lot of work for you know in the house and we all the boys had chores outside so we didn't socialize yeah, with him uh, you know was too busy dad kept us too busy <laughs> he worked in the limestone quarries yeah. okay where, where, where was the last time we Up above Valley Bend. Up, there's a road that goes off to your right after you go through Valley Bend. They <laughs> made, he made uh, 50 cents an hour. Wow. And I have a, a W-2 form of his, and he made $1,700 a year 
a year. And this is the little payment book where they make their payments to the bank. And, and it was how much? 1875. Because whenever, 1872, 1868, it was 18, see it there, it's close to 20. It was all on the, what yeah. was closer to 19, Interest. it was all 18 something. Yeah. Now when we moved from uh, the homesteads to Pelton County, Mom rent of the house for $20 just to cover that payment. Well, That's yeah. what Rudd's paid. I mean, it, it, this is their 20 where they borrowed the $2,500. For it for to pay on the house. For it in 1947 mm -hmm. to pay this off. No, to pay the house. Oh, okay. See, back then these people that worked on the green stuff worked, and that payment went on the house, mm -hmm. and then eventually they had, to, I guess, borrow money to finish paying for it. Oh. So Granddad had to borrow twenty five hundred dollars finish paying for his house. And that's what this, this record yeah. is? Yeah. Oh, okay. He borrowed it in 1947, oh, then he paid it off in 1952. Okay. In August. And then... So he didn't buy the house until 47. But they did that. And then this little photo is the men that worked at the Homestead Quarry. It was the work crew. They did the limestone and all that to build the houses for the for the homesteads. And my grandfather's in this photo. It's the top row. The, uh, the only ones I know are Remus Brock, Jess Welch, Oscar Fisher, Herman Hardman, Elmer Easley, Cap Hicks. In the bottom row we have Jake Kramer, Cecil Barb, John Lindsay, Wallace Hamrick, and Joe Moran. So, and I know quite a few of these people myself. I knew them as a child. I went to work at the mill in 1943. During the war period. Uh-huh. And they had square dances up over the restaurant in the South Torium on Saturday, Friday and Saturday nights and had church on Sunday. Oh yes, my dad especially, you know, he was very into history, so he, he always, I mean, he took me all over the state of West Virginia to different places, that's why I was able to get that whole golden horseshoe thing in the eighth grade, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he used to tell me, oh, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt, this was her project, and there's another one like this, it's over at Arthur Dale, and you know, things like that. He was always telling me. He would tell me, you know, that particularly the, the, the school was for the community. And he always made the point that it was built for the community. And that's probably why I'm interested in preserving it for the community now. Oh, you know, Because yeah. he always made such a, a big point that the whole point of putting this here was to help the community. Do you know that she drove herself here when she gave her a speech? Somebody she drove her own car and she got here like at 10.30 in the morning and there were 2,000 people in the gym uh, waiting. Yeah, waiting for her. I think they might have, it was in December, so it couldn't, I don't know what they had here, but it was, I don't, I was assuming it was something like a graduation, that's what I thought. But anyway, she drove herself all the way from Washington here. Do you remember seeing Mrs. Roosevelt at the school? Yes, yes. What happened that day? Oh, I can't remember. But uh, we all went to, to see you. The graduation? Yes. And well, I graduated over here. Did you ever see Miss Roosevelt up here? Oh yeah. When would she, did she come a lot or? I I saw her twice up here to school. Yeah. What was going on? Uh, she just come up here and visited. Well, the first graduation that they did up here, she and uh, Jennings Randolph both attended it, and they gave out the diplomas. What that year? That was 1940. 1940. Starting 39 to 40 was the very first. Class. Did you go to that one, Joe? I you, went to the first one. You went this year? And, and I went to one after that. She was up there. And she came in here and dedicated the Trade Center. Yeah. She and Doris Stuke. Wow. 
And then they danced down at Beverly in the OIOF hall. Because at one time, the government had that rented for activities and they danced still there. Upstairs. They wow. had dances. I was interested in, in the first graduating class. I think you said your brother was in that one? Sherman. So Sherman, Sherry. Sherman and Howard both was in that class. Okay, so they were there when Miss Roosevelt came okay. to, were you all there? No. I, I was, can't remember. I was okay. too little. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because you were just... I, I shouldn't was, have remembered. I can remember a lot of things over in that classroom, but I don't remember seeing Mrs. Roosevelt. What what grade were you in? I was in the first grade, the first year that the oh, school so started. You, and you yeah. were way too little oh, at that yeah. point. Yeah. So your parents probably didn't bring you to the... Oh, I, we didn't go to very many social events, but I wouldn't think they would have missed it. I don't know. There were a thousand tickets, and they gave those tickets out to all the homestead folks mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. They were the first. Mm -hmm. and well, then, if Mom and Dad went, we didn't. I I would have remembered that, I think. But I maybe they didn't go. Well, I wouldn't have been old enough to go properly. Right. Yeah. Would, I don't know what. I don't know if they did or not. It was a big event. Was the homestead school planned the whole time to be there? I mean, I know it was last to come in, but uh, it was something that they had allotted money for. They, they closed all the little schools. And they, they had planned, I guess, to do that. And then the they, teachers... Go they ahead. bought the land from uh, Penley, what, yeah. 1934? Yeah, yeah. The, the property that the school sits on. When they started uh, building the homestead. I used to go up there. They had they'd have cakewalks. You remember that? Oh yeah, we had cakewalks all the time. And they had these hillbilly shows that came in here from Clarksburg, Wheeling, and Fairmont. Yeah, who did you say, Grandpa Jones? Grandpa, Your grandpa Jones. Was here. Oh wow! Uh, and, well, it was a, it was considered a community. It said it's a big set community and school. Uh, and Stony Cooper, Wilma Lee. Wilma Lee. My, uh, I can remember my mother saying my my uh, great uncle Addison Bosserman had a group, the Bosermans, and they played around here because she said they did they have them on the radio? Did they have radio they, they shows? They had a stage up there. Oh, at the at the school. There was a lot of bleachers along the side of the wall in there in the gym. And Mr. Snyder was uh, my sixth grade teacher, and he catered to the boys of playing basketball in there. The girls never got never got to play. We didn't ball. have sports. The girls had to sit on the bleachers and watch the boys play, but we never got we never got to participate in ball games or anything. Which is always the boys. Yeah, they had dances here. Uh... Uh, we used to have uh, groups come in like uh, gospel groups that sung songs, you know, uh, uh, I think there's one called the Sunshine Boys and a lot of groups like that. Uh, had assembly programs and, and uh, put on plays, you know, a class would put on a play. I was, I don't know, I don't think I was an actor, but I was generally in all the plays, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we had uh, a lot of fun, a lot of things like that happened. You see, my brother went here through ninth grade, so the older kids, you know, did do some things, but then they cut back and the eighth grade ended up being the oldest class for a few years, and then eventually those kids were gone too, so there wasn't, there wasn't kids to so do. So your brother went here in the 50s? He did. He started here, let's see, he's eight years older than me. Oh no, he's, he went to Tigers Valley <clears throat> when we moved. I was four, so he was 12. Uh -huh. And he told my parents they were ruining his social life by them moving to Valley Bend from the creek. <laughs> I never really forgave my parents for that, or for having me, he too. But, but, wait. but yeah, he went here then, that would have been his 7th, 8th, and ninth grade years. And they had a play. They did a play every spring, I'll never forget that. And Nancy Butcher, who was in his class, had to faint. And he had to pick her up and carry her off stage. I was, it was lovely. 
I think she was also his girlfriend, so it was just a lovely scene. But by the time I came along, they didn't do plays anymore. The stage, you know, was uh, when, in basketball season, the basketball uh, backboard and hoop was fastened to part of the one of the sections of the stage, and uh, then it would would be there uh, on the, the uh, would be the east end of the gym. Uh, that was the stage end, and uh, then whenever basketball season was out, then the, the uh, uh, Parts of the stage were moved back to make the stage for, for other functions and graduations and assemblies and so on. But during basketball season, the parts of the stage were, were moved and they were put on the sides. And uh, when there was a basketball game on, they would put chairs up on them. And then the, so a lot of the kids would sit on the edge of it. So it gave seating on the, on the sides. So that, that stage moves? That stage moves. Yes. Wow. There was. Uh, Did you know that? They, they were built that. in sections. You know, uh, we're going back a few years, but it seems like the dimensions would probably have been maybe four by eight sections, maybe a little little larger. But uh, I can remember whenever I was. Uh, uh, of course, in grade school you didn't do it. When you got up to seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, why well, the the boys would help move those. Do you remember anything else about being on stage? Or? Yeah, just the uh, Mrs. Beveridge directing some Beveridge. of the song. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and the um, being able to go across that balcony and see an activity going on down here. Oh yes, the jukebox. Yeah. Jukebox over here in the corner. We did have when when I was in eighth or ninth grade, we was allowed to dance at on our lunch hour. But nobody got on that gymnasium floor if you didn't have tennis shoes or socks. I don't remember. You had, I remember dancing. You had to. Well, it wasn't much dance, and the girls were here, and the boys were here, and the girls danced with each other. Yeah. Yeah, you could go to the gym. Of course, when you went to the gymnasium, I saw it's going to take some work down there to get that up. When that, when Mr. Donor was here as a principal, you couldn't walk in that gym unless you had tennis shoes on, you know. Uh, kids wear tennis shoes today now all, all day long. All of, but then, you know, tennis shoes was just used for uh, basketball and that kind of stuff. But if you didn't have tennis shoes, you went to the gym, you didn't get in there unless you took your shoes off, you went in your sock feet. And you'd have a jukebox there and, and uh, at noon time, you know, when it was bad, you couldn't go outside and play or do anything, you could go in the gym and, and dance, you know. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. Oh yes, that jukebox was entertainment to be none compared. And we would uh, always enjoy that after lunch and before school. And uh, it seemed like this school was filled with music. You always had a Christmas pro program every year, you know, and your parents come to watch that. And then we had a glee club. Um, Arnold, Van, Arnold Weiss was our band director and he also did the choir. Right, well we, we set up the chairs and he, he, you know, you set this row up but then the next row behind it, you didn't put the chairs right, you had to offset them so that the people in the, you know, each row would be able to see. I mean, he, he taught us that. We, we marched out here, he taught us to march. Um, well, that must have been great. <laughs> Left face, right face, about face. You probably loved it in there. <laughs> I did. I did. Uh, of course, he was military. He had been in the military. I didn't know that. And, uh, was great. So, but right out here was where we practiced. And we'd come in the summer. And even in the summer, it gave us something to do because at least once a week we were here practicing. When I was in junior high, I loved the balcony. We, we liked it, and then especially when you got into seventh grade and you had the whole upstairs. That was wonderful. But I can remember standing on that balcony and watching a carpenter put down that floor. And I told Pauline, he was old and he was down on his knees putting that, that wood down. And that was Mr. Swagger. He ended up being my father-in-law. Uh -huh. <laughs> 
But he, he put the floor down, and the floor is still in there where he put down. For concerts, we brought in folding chairs, and we set them up in the gym, on the gym floor. Um, and you guys were on the stage. And we were, well, the, the band would be set up on the floor, and the glee club was usually on the, on the oh, stage. That's neat. And he would have a theme every year. Uh, one year, I remember we did the song, Itsy Bitsy Teeny Weeny Yellow Polka Dot Bikini. And he had a, a two-year-old daughter, and he had her come out. <laughs> In the, in the little bikini while we were singing that song. But he always had a theme, and, and his songs were uh, chosen. The songs we played in the band and the songs that the Glee Club sang. And uh, we did have a band. We never had band uniforms. You wore blue jeans and a white shirt, and then white, your white shoes, marching shoes. But uh, he had a Glee Club, and we would drive to Monterville every year on the bus, and we would do a program, a singing program, at the Monterville School. That was our big outing, you know. <laughs> but uh, we would put on uh, a show here every year. The choir would sing, and, you know, the parents would come. It was a little program we did in, at night. Well, I'd like to tell you that I played in the band. Okay. That was one of your questions yes, that Lucille was. mentioned. I played the drums and the cymbals, uh, and uh -huh. I loved it. I wanted to play the drums, and they wouldn't oh. let me because I was a girl. Oh, well, this was probably before you got here. Oh, my goodness, that's uh, great. I, I could play the bass and the snare drums and the cymbals, and we marched in the Force Festival Parade. The streets in Elkins was all brick at that time and they were really hard to march on. You could stump your toe and down you went. But it was, it was good. Yes, we went to the Force Festival right? You know, our band was big because we didn't have no football team, so we didn't have no coaches to harass the boys. You know, the boys would come right along was in the band. I remember we would have a Christmas program every year, too, and sing, and we had, our band would play, things like that. So the, you had the band was here. Mm -hmm. What what grades did it go through then? If I recall correctly, it was about third grade. We would get these um, like recorders, yeah. you know, and start out with them. And um, I remember starting out with Miss Spurgeon. She oh, was yeah. here then. Uh huh. Wow. And then you went from that to selecting what instrument you wanted to do the next year, and then you could be in the band. <laughs> we were a close knit bunch of Homestead. Yes. That's what it seemed like, you know, you, and you were happy. Oh, we were happy because we didn't know any better. You know, uh, we were poor, but we didn't know that we were poor. And um, coming out of the Depression, uh, it's what we knew. Uh, in, in this room right here, started first grade, and st still have good memories of that. Miss Stoniker was my teacher in the first grade, and um, I, I went to school here through the sixth grade, and um, most of my classmates, we were all together, and we were all, all friends, <clears throat> and uh, it was just a wonderful atmosphere. I could, couldn't ask for a better childhood. <laughs> well, I, I just think they took a lot of pride in this school. I think. People took pride back then in the community. They took pride in the school. They wanted the children to excel. I mean, the people come to functions here. The parents. Sure, there were there were. Um, my mom was uh, in the PTA. We had homeroom mothers who came and bought the cupcakes and all that. Of course, now you can't have cupcakes because those are bad for you. You know. So now, uh, poor kids. I don't know. I guess they get apple juice. I don't know. But we had Kool Aid and cupcakes and. You know, and we had a little we had a little parade. You know, for Halloween, we all get our costumes on, and if our moms needed to dress as they could in the ladies' room or you know the men's room, or I remember not the room. But anyway, we would parade you know through every every uh, room, and then we'd come back to our room and all the other grades. Would. So we were just this special little bubble. I love it here. Yeah. And every time I ever went by this school, I always told my kids all about this school and how it was. And uh, they just never were in it, but I, they were always told about it. My dad was custodian here, and we would come to events here when Daddy had to, if it was not during school time, it was on the weekend. 
but you would see people and you would recognize them. But, uh, I've run 28 years and I put, I, I bet you I'll never put five fuses in this whole building in 28 years. Right? Right. So this is the door where they put in the coal for the heating system, the coal-fired steam heating system. And they would open this door and back up a truck and shovel the coal in through this opening. And it would go down into the coal room. And from time to time, the students would actually help shovel the coal in. But then later on, they used a dump truck that had a special chute on the back of it that fit right into this opening and they would just tip the bed up and it would gradually feed the coal right down in through this opening. Yeah, this is, this is where the coal was stored and uh, you can see the door up there where the coal would come through. And then the uh, custodian would shovel it into the wheelbarrow. And uh, this old uh, boiler here, it had a extension out on here that um, had a uh, system called stokers that would actually pull the coal into the firebox. And so the custodian would bring a wheelbarrow load of coal out and dump it in and gradually it would pull into the firebox to heat the uh, boiler system. This old furnace here, this is all steam heat. Yeah. Rather than hot water, it ain't like hot water. Yeah. I brought up a wheelbarrow every once a year, hauling these things out here. The Mr. Swecker always kept the uh, Gene Swecker kept the fires going, the coal stove or coal furnace, all that. Yeah, I don't remember ever being cold in either. school. I don't remember mm -hmm. being cold. And I even got to meet people like Jenny Popper worked here, Claire Sonica worked here. Yeah. And, wow. And I knew them from my weaving class. Oh. Look at those looms. Yeah, those are. Oh my lord. Those are original. Oh. They were set up unbelievable. The loom shop, which was on that road. Wow. This is probably Alice Turner's. This is the Snyder loom. I'm looking on Alice. There was a loom by uh, that belonged to Alice Turner. She was a home economist for Randolph County when they sold these looms. And she acquired one of them. Then Dr. Roberts' mother also bought one of these looms. And this may be hers. This is from the Department of Agriculture during the WPA project. We acquired them. The, the little weaving building was the f building right below the service station oh, down that's here. That was a weaving center. The next building down, which is a church now, was was a, the wood woodworking shop for the homesteaders to go build furniture or do whatever. And then, then the big long one was a re freight receiving from the railroad that got all the freight in. Eleanor Roosevelt shared with presidential advisor Harry Hopkins an abiding faith in the unemployed, a belief that they were decent, honest people suffering through no fault of their own. Totally deserving of government help, Mrs. Roosevelt and Harry Hopkins kept their minds a vivid picture of the lives of these people, and that image drove them to push the government to create as many jobs for as many people as possible. We found Olive Goodwin teaching a weaving class. She told us of learning this craft at the homestead. Olive said that the differing appearances of the homestead houses was a result of the individual making his house fit his own desires and needs. This individuality, she explained, was responsible for the downfall of community weaving. The problem they ran into there was the girls worked on shifts, and maybe they wouldn't finish up a piece and then the next girl would come in would start where she left off and no two people weave alike and so they weren't 
tell them all. I knew her, I knew of her. Her and my mom were colleagues, they were friends. And uh, I, had, I was, went to her house for a birthday party for her, must have been her niece or maybe a granddaughter. I'm not sure she had children, but anyway. Uh, so I went to this party where I didn't know anybody, but I just, just talked and played games and it was fine. You know, it worked out fine, but I did not know a soul. I was pretty little. But yeah, Ollie was a good, good lady. She was. She, and, and I've got that quilt. I've got it in the car. Oh, good. If you want to see it. That. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it was Ladies of the Church that made it, I think, is what it is. But it has all their names on Mrs. Bettler, she died just a few years ago. Violet Sweck lived down in the corner. Um, Mrs. Snyder, that was Peggy, that's uh, Betsy Tenney's grandmother mm -hmm. up there on the top. Right? She made one. And she's the Phyllis one that did those, uh, the weaving, too, right? Miss Snyder? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, she did. There's yeah. Icy Stoniker. <laughs> Mrs. Height. Mrs. Height. But my husband said, what are you going to do with that old quilt? I said, well, I'm not going to put it on the porch, that's for sure. You can't put them on the porch and use them. Yeah. My, my porch furniture, I have uh, wicker. But I said, oh, no, I'm keeping this one. This one's well, so uh, big. I love Don it. Don Gloria Bettler, she just passed too. That's what I said, she just yeah. passed away. Mary Moore's passed I figure you most everybody on here. Yeah. Lucille Buchanan. Uh -huh. She's wow. passed. Huh. She passed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. This would be a nice piece to get framed and hung mm -hmm. in there if you ever get this thing going. Yeah. Yeah. And I would let them do that. That'd I, be a I nice. Would. I'd give it up. But I just, I love it. I just love this quilt. The classroom that's adjacent to this one, we, we have some looms, some weaving looms that are upstairs. We're going to bring those down and we hope to have weaving classes for folks in the future. Um, this room is pretty much going to be a museum uh, as time goes by. All, all the historical elements of the building that can be moved will be moved to this room. I think we felt superior. Yeah. <laughs> we, we were, we were a, a, a close-knit weaving on here, you know, and we had a large size class and we had bonded, and so we went up there, and we remained bonded, but we, you know, we met other people up there, too. But this was such a special place. Mrs. Brown came to the school when uh, I went into seventh grade, and she taught science, and she taught home ec. Um, we had to do science projects. She would ha hand out a, whatever your topic was, and to do a science project, and she had, um, outside people come in and judge our science projects. So that it wasn't just sports, it was letting each child, pretty much each child had a part, you know, a, an ability to, you had accomplished something during the year and here's what we did. Here's what we did throughout the year in band and glee club. Here's what we did in our home ec class. And it was very special here. I took shop, yeah, you could take shop when you got into seventh grade. And uh, Mr. Godden, he was our shop teacher. First thing you had to do was square up a sand block. Block, you know, you sanded with. And uh, it had to be, uh, it seemed to me like it was two and a half inches wide and, and uh, four inches long, I believe, the way the measurements was. And it had to be perfectly square. And, he cut you a block, and the only thing you had to, to uh, work on that with was you had a, a square and a, a hand plane, and that's about how you squared it up. And you had, generally, I think probably I spent about two and a half months to get my block squared up. Then, then you made a mop and broom holder. That was your first two uh, things you made in shop. And after you made your uh, mop and broom holder, uh, then you could make end tables or, you know, you could pick out something that you like to make. And I had woodworking shop in, in the school for in the school. junior high, 7th, 8th, and 9th grade. It's sitting in there and I got one of your brothers. Bob's? Uh, but they had the stage in the gym. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And back of the stage was the woodworking shop. Okay. And the CC boys came over here at night and worked in the in the shop, but when they had it down here, um, 
people around here went in there and worked. And shopped for the, for the guys in home economics. And it's really sad now. Back then our parents taught us how to cook and how to do things. The parents nowadays don't do it, so the kids don't have anywhere to learn that. And that's sad. I have a, a ro my rolling pin was made by my brother in the shop. Wow. And I have a little book, uh, a little book holder that he made. And I don't know, it's just. That's just, a great. Yeah. yeah. But those, but it was really good because the, the boys learned a lot of things about shop, about how to build and how to do wood and cut and everything. And we learned, we learned how to balance checkbooks. We learned how to sew. We learned how to do everything. It was called home economics. That's what you learned was the economics. They made a lot of broomstick skirts. That's yeah. what they were called. Out of feed sacks. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> we, we did. We out of feed bags? Had, oh, a, yeah. had a lot of clothes made out of feed sacks. And if it was Ethel's turn for the pattern that she chose, she would go with Dad to the feed store at, at Mill Creek and she could pick out the feed sacks. She would. Would. And the next time it was my turn. And the next time it was my sister's turn. But I remember making a lot of, they were called broomstick skirts. Mm -hmm. They were just gathered around the waist with a a band on it. I don't even, well, there had to be a placket. Yeah, you there know. was a placket. And, and uh, a I lot of peasant blouses that came down, you know, low. And you, so you wore the peasant blouses and the broomstick skirts. And uh, it was either singing uh, with the choir or it was a jukebox. Did you dance? Oh, yes, we danced. We couldn't get the boys to dance, but we danced. We had a good time dancing. Oh, man. Yeah, it was a good social interaction. Uh, you could talk with friends, or you could dance, or you could play in the gym, whatever you felt like doing. So that was really, I mean, that was your socialization time? I mean, oh, all yes. Of it was, in but... the wintertime, that was our socialization. And in the summertime, we'd be out in the backfield, and uh, that's where we did softball and other games. I played basketball too. They they wouldn't let the girls play basketball, but they didn't go up against any other school yeah. teams or anything. But we did play basketball. They had the homestead had a basketball team, and we played uh, uh, Elkins, we played Casson, we played uh, uh, Parsons, uh, and I think we played Davis. And of course, in those days, you didn't take the school bus. Uh, it went in cars, and uh, then the basketball practice, uh, uh, there were not that many vehicles going up and down the, the, the valley, and occasionally if uh, somebody couldn't come or a parent couldn't come, you'd walk home, uh -huh. and it was no big deal, I mean, it was just what you did. Most of the rooms here in this building were used as classrooms. There was a teacher's lounge room that it was, it was teacher's lounge and it also served as a nur the nurse's station too when the nurse would be here. Uh, I remember getting my immunization shots and everything like that here. It wasn't during class time, it would be you know, sometime later in the evening and I remember my parents bringing me here for my immunization shots. Um, there's a room in, off the main hallway here that was uh, a library, and um, so, but most most of the rooms were classrooms, and unfortunately, I only got to go to the sixth grade here. But most of the upstairs classrooms were for like the junior high classes. You had the same teachers. Claire Steinecker was first grade from the time I came to the time I left, and she was here many years after. <laughs> I remember Mrs. Daniels when I was in fifth grade. Um, she always, we signed. She, we had the red uh, songbooks. Mary Daniels. Yeah, Mary Daniels. And we sang. And, um, but she would take us at recess time in the gym and she was teaching us how to square dance. And do, she taught us how to do the Virginia Reel. And, um, 
It just there seemed like there's always things going on. When we first got to school, we all went into the gym. So the bus would drop off and then everybody went into the gym. We had a very large gym and um, it was just kind of where everybody waited. And then they would take us to the cafeteria if we wanted to eat breakfast and the cooks um, cooked some meals from scratch for breakfast, but there was also some packaged foods. You know, that was kind of, the 80s were kind of the beginning era of the pre-packaged foods that you would have in schools. We did have three or four cooks at the time though. Um, and so we did get some scratch made things. So we started at the gym, went to the cafeteria, and then from there the bell would ring and we would go to our individual classrooms. The smaller kids' classes were on the first floor of the school, like kindergarten through third grade, and then upstairs in the school was four, five, and six. It was a happy school, and there weren't, children didn't get into any mischief much. And if they did, you know, it was a big thing, but no, uh, it, it was a happy place to be. I never had a problem with any of the teachers. I loved them all. And we didn't love Mrs. Hockleberry. And you talk to anybody about Mrs. Hockleberry, they'll start laughing. <laughs> but uh, my aunt told me, she said, now my cousin had been there, she said, you just treat her nice and she'll treat you nice. And that's what she always treated me nice. I never got no trouble. But uh, now my cousin, uh, Joe and Charlie, you now they would take the ramps and put down the heater. And uh, you know, it just about killed her. And she complained to the uh, uh, principal that the kids uh, were bringing ramp sandwiches to school. Well, Charlie said, well, that's all we had, you know. And so she kept on about the ramps and the kids brought some ramps to school that one morning, put down the radiator, and I guess it smelled pretty right by evening. Oh, bad. She, she was mad that time, but I wasn't around, but I wouldn't have thought of doing something like that. Well, Mr. Van Devender could be severe. I remember him taking a ruler and smacking it on the table and getting our attention. We, we, we were too loud. And, uh, but like I said, I never had any run-ins. He never set me in the hall or anything. Oh, I did get set in the hall in junior high. Or you remember, no, you don't remember. We didn't go to junior high together. Yeah, when I was upstairs for the, um, for St. Patrick's Day, I dyed my hair green. What? Most <laughs> rebellious thing I ever did in my life. Dyed my hair green and all of the teachers set me in the hall that day. Uh, me and, and myself and two, other, and two other students who were blonde. So you could really see it in their hair, you know. My mother thought it was a lark. She gave me the food coloring. I mean, it was, you know, it comes it was cake. Out. Yeah, you can wash it out. But anyway, oh, I had really, really missed it. Yeah, so the only teacher that didn't set me in the hall today was Mrs. Burner. Mrs. Burner was the science teacher, and she thought it was pretty cool. So, you know, I stayed in her <laughs> class. But everybody, all the other junior high teachers. Whenever I was here, this was the first grade, the next second grade. Of course, Mrs. Pence was third grade the office in the library, then uh, Mrs. Hockenberry was fourth grade, Mrs. Smith fifth grade, across the hall was sixth grade. But then you went upstairs, that was in the uh, uh, seventh grade, you went upstairs. And of course then you changed classes, you know, they had math teacher, English teacher, geography, and, and history, whatever. And then you changed classes uh, every, every hour then, you know, so. I liked this school, I liked my teachers, I mean, they, the same ones were here, I think, the, almost the whole time I was here. Might have changed a few in the junior high before I got up there, but I mean, the same teachers were here for a long, long time. Do you remember, you know, you were talking about Mr. Donor. So, do you remember kids that got in trouble in school? Was there very much of that, or did he pretty much, nobody wanted to get in trouble? There was very little. <laughs> I'll figure. Very little. It was... Uh, yeah, it, if he had to uh, do some little applied education uh, or applied psychology, <laughs> it was about once a year. <laughs> and whenever everybody heard the uh, uh, echo of that happening, <laughs> there was uh, no misbehavior. <laughs> Teachers should be masters of their subject matter to give children more than just a superficial understanding. Teachers were to be active participants in the community, identifying with its life and interest. The teachers were residents and neighbors, Clapp wrote. 
Their life is part of the community. Their comings and goings are part of the happenings. The work of the school with the children, health matters, social matters, takes them everywhere, into homes, in contact with people of every kind. But he loved the kids. I mean, I, I remember as I walked through the doors this morning, I remember that he was usually always out, standing out there, either there at the door, and always smiling, greeting the children. He and always there, every he, he greeted us, and he was always standing there as we left, too. That's my memory, anyway. Well, I had great respect for him. He towered way over me. But he had this wonderful side to him that I dearly loved where he sold chocolate popsicles, uh, fudge sickles to us at noon. There's a, there's a in the, down in the school down the hallway, there's a, like a concession stand looking thing that rolls up and he would be there at noon selling fudge sickles. And some, if I had money, you know, that day I would go down and buy a fudge sickle at lunchtime. So he had this really cool part to him, but he, he was a very good. I, I was never sent to the, the principal's office, so I, I didn't know him in that way. Probably very close, especially when I tattled and when I wrote a note, you know, or answered a note. But um, no, he, he was a good, good man, but he, he ruled the roost. He, was, he kept law and order here. Was he the principal here most of those years? I guess he was, because everybody I talked about him. Yeah. I, th I don't know whether he was the original one or not, but now I know he lived in the house next door that was built for the principal to live in. But it was a two-story house, yeah. and that's for the principal. It was built for the principal to live in. And having our principal living next door was a plus for the school. So he could be here at any point in time. He was here all the time, and you never, ever, ever wanted to be sent to Mr. Dunner's office. <laughs> I remember before school that we would always have breakfast and um, we always have to mop up the floor because with five children in the family there was a lot of mud tracked in and out so mom made sure that we got that kitchen floor clean before we all took off and uh, we caught the bus right in front of our house so it didn't take us very long to to run down and catch a bus once we saw it coming around the curve. Oh yes, our bus driver was Bruce, Bruce Stoniker, and he was wonderful. We had so much fun on the bus. It's something you can't compare to now when you hear about bus drivers and students on the bus. We never had um, kids that got in trouble, and um, I guess it's because we all had so much fun. He would hit certain little nose on the road and bump us around and and uh, he communicated with us constantly so that's he was excellent bus driver in kindergarten I remember that the teacher came to my house and she had a home visit and so I got to meet the kindergarten teacher Barbara Hornbeck beforehand and it was a really exciting day I can remember being in the living room and preparing and my mom and I had been reading books and things to prepare for that and then in the school, to prepare for an everyday school day, my mom would, my mom worked in town, so she had to drive to Elkins, and so she often left before the bus got there. So we, you know, we just got ready like any other family, had a breakfast, and um, she would lay out all my stuff the night before, and then I had to walk to the end of the street to the bus stop and wait for the other kids. So everybody there rode a bus. Hardly anybody's parents took them to school, you know, because it was mostly a middle-class, working-class neighborhood and everybody rode the bus, and the bus followed the same route, and I had the same two bus drivers my whole life, just about, and, you know. It was well, we rode a bus. We had to walk, though. We walked. I probably walked a half of a mile to get them to the bus stop to catch the bus, and that was, that's where you got on the bus, and that's where you got off, and it didn't matter how much snow there was, we went to school. Was no, there was snow, days. <laughs> no snow days in our life. I rode the bus. I had to walk. <laughs> Children now don't walk very far to the bus. But I had to walk. You know where my house is, down on the corner from the Methodist Church. I had to walk up around to the middle street. And that was back when snow was way steep because I was short. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you had to walk up to, to catch the bus. 
Well, uh, I was really blessed because my dad was my school bus driver too. And uh, only a mile away, uh, but you know, I really looked forward to riding the bus since my dad was a school bus driver. And uh, right down the road in Daly, <clears throat> there was an old one room schoolhouse that they had gutted out and put on big doors. And that was actually the bus garage. So I would go there with my dad when he'd be cleaning out his bus. So I, I was exposed to being on the bus even before I started in school. But we would get on, get off the bus, and of course come in, come into the class, you know, and, and put away our hat and coat or whatever, and uh, we'd sit down to a table or, or sit down at a desk, and you know, we'd start our school day every day. We got on a school bus that picked us up over there. They used to have bus stops ever so far apart over in Daly. Now, you know, they pick the kids up at their driveways, most of them. But it used to be there was uh, like four bus stops over there. So, of course, I was lucky where I was at. I only had to walk about maybe as far as near out the main highway to the R bus stop. Some of those kids had to walk from the back road to her down to the front road. Or, you know, if you live farther away from the bus stop, some of them had a pretty good distance there to walk. Well, whenever we got off the bus, we, uh, we got on the bus over there at 8 o'clock and school took up at 8.30. So by the time you got here and, and got uh, your coats or whatever you had put up and all, you know, and of course then uh, everyone went to their classroom and the first thing was the Pledge of Allegiance. And back then they probably wouldn't let the, let the teachers do it now. But back then they had what they called the health class. They had to put your hands out, you know, and they checked your fingernails and all this stuff. And they probably wouldn't let them do that now, you know. But, I started the school here in this very room. It was first grade. My teacher was Claire Steinecker. I was five years old. I was next to the youngest person in my class by eight days. She was eight days younger than me. Uh, I went to school here the whole nine years. It was a nine-year school then at that time. I went the whole nine years here. I lived in East Delhi the whole time until I finished school. And uh, when you finished ninth grade here, you either had to go to Taylor's Valley High School or Beverly High School. Well, since my family went to Beverly High School, I went to Beverly High School, so. Unfortunately, I only got to go to the sixth grade here, but most of the upstairs classrooms were for like the junior high classes. Yeah, I went to Taylor's Valley in, in seventh grade. And uh, you know, it, I, re I really felt kind of sorrowful for having to leave Homestead because this, this uh, was uh, my, my place kind of away from home for so long. Uh, I remember going to uh, Tarrant Valley in the seventh grade. I was excited about it and uh, all of a sudden I, all these boys that I didn't even know wanted to fight with me. <laughs> and so who paid the teachers? I don't know if the government did or not. I know they paid the two in the school up there behind Slim Dolly. Okay. Because I know Romine or um, one of the other girls or Coberly would bring the checks up and give them to them. Okay. Was that paid through the state, Joe? They were. I'm sure there was a board of education. I would say by them paying them, by them paying them, the government was paying yeah. them. Of course, this, this was a subsidized the community, so. Right. So they, the government sent, they, they chose the teachers then, too. The, these real minor coberly mm -hmm. usually brought, and there was a woman teacher. Mm -hmm. It was, wasn't Claire Stonecker. That's the only name that comes to my mind. I had Alta, uh, an Alta McDonald, a Huffman, yeah. up there. And I know that uh, Coley would bring her, was usually the one that brought her check to her. Okay. And then Woody Crouch was the other teacher. I had him as a teacher, too. Yeah, uh -huh. and Mr. Romine would come up there. And Mr. Romine I had. Mm -hmm. Wow. And they would bring them checks and hand them to them. Just hand them like I'd hand you a check. <laughs> wow! They were in an envelope, so, so they were I probably would say paid the by the government. government. Was paying them. It takes an adult who is dedicated to what they're doing uh, to.
to teaching um, to the students. And I, I think every teacher that I had had that dedication to their students. I remember Miss Hofer, she was a tough teacher, but she was really a good teacher. But um, you, they didn't make that much money either. You know, you think about it, back in that day, they probably didn't make much money at all. Yeah, but, I don't. But they were really, you know, proud of their profession. And, they were. You know, they wanted to do a good job by the students. And they were respected. Uh, if you were a teacher, I think the community respected you. And the parents um, backed up the teachers, it sounds Yes, like. yes. In fact, I like to go to school. This was our first grade room here. Mrs. Sutton was our teacher. And, uh, of course, you know, it was like classes were pretty big then. We had about 30, probably between 30 and 35 students in a class then. Uh, everyone in East Daly there, most of them were young people come to the homesteads when it was built. And where did they get their food from there at the hot lunch to cook? Well, the government furnished part of it, I know. Okay. Because when Polly taught in Glenmore, they were still furnishing it. Okay. I guess the main staple part of it, like, you know, it's uh -huh. like the cheese program and the peanut butter and all that stuff from Egg way, and way back when. I would have met. That was part of their subsidies. <clears throat> we used to look forward when we were doing hot lunch. If you didn't like what they had, they always had the, the peanut butter with, with syrup, sweeter sandwiches. Yeah. So that was our staple every now and then. They made cabbage sandwiches. And they made mashed bean sandwiches early. Mashed beans, wow. And an apple, and I've, I've got some of the original uh, menus from the school when they first started, of what they fed them, and it, it oh. was very smart. We just lined up and uh, went. I don't remember having to carry a tray. I remember going into the, the hallway, the long hallway there at the cafeteria, and just finding our seat. And we would start at the beginning of that table and keep coming down to the end. And then we'd start at the end and start all the way back up to the other end. Well, I think we were probably like every other school in America, probably watching the classroom clock, excitedly waiting to get up for our desks. You know, I, I can't remember exactly what we did, but I think I've, I've had some memories of that's what happened. And then I believe that a bell would ring and we would all line up. And then, we, you know, in elementary school, everything is about control, controlling the chaos. So you line up and you walk down the hallway to get into line. And the school secretary would sit in the doorway of the cafeteria and if you didn't, every student had a number and she would punch your number into the computer as you went through. And honestly, if you didn't remember your number, that lady had every kid's number memorized in that school. She, if you couldn't remember your number when you went through, she would remember it. And I guess that's how they kept track of free and reduced lunches and who, who ate hot lunch and who didn't eat hot lunch. And I, I think there was a cold lunch table and then there were people who ate hot lunch at different tables, if I'm remembering correctly. They set tables up in the hallway, and then later they set them up in the gym, but it was in the hallway, and we uh, got our trays and sat down, sat in the hallway. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Ma Hedrick was one of the cooks, and uh, Neva Swecker was another cook. Um, very good food, all home cooked. It was crazy because you had lunch down that hallway and then you had to you had to go in the thing and get your lunch tray and then you went out and found you a place to see it and then when you were done you took your tray back and 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 dumped your tray and then went back to your room. There was bells go off, you know, and uh, of course the teachers would tell us when it was our lunch time, you know they. They, they would have lunches here in shifts. You know, when you're a little kid, you don't think about things like that, but they, they did it in shifts for each class. Um, at that time, our lunchroom was on the far back side of the building in what was most recently the library and preschool area, and that was our lunchroom. Back in those days, the cooks would put the food in bowls and you would sit down and, and pass the bowls of food around. You didn't go down a cafeteria line. And so, it, it, there again, it was just a feeling of, of shared community. Because everything was so good, it just, uh, there's no, 
there's no uh, comparison uh, with menus today that may be boxed and menus back when I grew up in Homestead. Well, we did have hot lunch here, which we did not have when we went to Tuggards Valley. We had to take our lunch. And of course, you could bring your lunch here if you wanted and store it in your locker. But they did have hot lunch, and it was down the hall. Um, we would, you know, walk together as a, as a class. Um, and it wasn't expensive, but there were children who could not afford it. Some of those children were allowed to work in the kitchen and pay for their lunches that way. You know, so they're some of the older kids, like, you know, the junior high kids, not the younger kids. But um, they would have all kinds of things. There were things that I knew if they were having that day, I was like, I don't want to eat a hot lunch that day. Can I have a bologna sandwich or something? And some of my best memories are, you know, picking out a lunch box for school that year. But um, they had Spanish rice a lot. I did not, I did not, I still don't like it. And when I go to Mexican restaurants, it's still like, do you really have to have that? I, you know, can I have you know just the, the taco or whatever <laughs> and not have that? But um, they had nutritious lunch. And it seems to me there was always bread and butter on the table as well, and maybe even peanut butter. So if you didn't really just couldn't eat that Spanish rice, there was something else there that you're gonna get fed that day, you know. But but that was a that was a good system. And um, it's funny you would think that because I just I hadn't thought of that in a long time, but yeah. And then we went to Tigers Valley, and they had no hot lunch. It's like, okay, so, you know, my dad made very little, but, you know, sometimes he'd give me money for lunch, and most of the time I packed my lunch at Tigers Valley. It wasn't, it, it wasn't the chaos. I mean, everything was disciplined. It was almost like being in the military. <laughs> I mean, nobody cut up and carried on very much. Did you bring your lunch, or did you do hot lunch? I got, uh, I, my aunt always gave you the money for lunch, so I wouldn't drink the milk though. She had to make me chocolate uh, syrup to bring. I couldn't stand that milk. We were the uh, original organic. <laughs> <laughs> we were. We had organic food in the mouth. <laughs> That's true. That is true. Yeah. Uh, everything was homegrown, and as I said, the. The bread was homemade, the pies were homemade, the cakes were homemade. I mean, that was that We was didn't life. know we were organic. No, we didn't we know were, we were organic. We were, didn't know it. <laughs> we thought we were poor. <laughs> We'd wait for that last bell, and the uh, teacher would tell us to get ready for uh, dismissal, and we'd line up in a line and uh, go out and get on the respective buses. <laughs> It was crazy. You had a bus going to Valley Bend, a bus going to East Alley, you know, you had to know which bus to get on to go. And, uh, you know, you just got on the bus and went. And they had to run that schedule because those bus drivers also had to go to Beverly and get kids and bring back and home Tyers Valley and get kids and bring back. So there wasn't, you couldn't play around. They had they, a schedule. <laughs> you know, and in those days in Homestead School, you didn't have the... Uh, computers and the internet, you have to use the encyclopedia and the dictionary. <laughs> yeah, and the card catalog. <laughs> the card catalog. I mean, they, the they still catalog. have the card catalog. Yep, yep. I wanted to show you something, Evelyn. Um, uh, look here. Believe it or not, but we found your report card. You're a great student. From the school. We found your report card over at the school. Oh my, I'll put that in the frame. <laughs> You're a great student. What was that? Yeah, look at that. You got A's. I, I, I don't have my glasses. Let me show you. You had all 90s. You was a good student. You had all 90s and 92s and 95s. You only oh. missed three days of school. Oh my, in, ain't that nice. In the second grade, you missed three days of school. And then one other time, you missed two and a half. Oh, so you was a pretty, you was a pretty faithful student. I love it so. Having humble beginnings as participants in the resettlement movement, the Taggart's Valley homesteaders were sometimes equated by those opposed to the movement as being on the dole or receiving relief. However, all of the original Taggart's Valley homesteaders paid off what they owed on their homes, which is an accolade that they alone have earned. And I read out in front that this was, this was the project 
that everybody paid back. I mean, it was set up for them to be able to pay back, to purchase their property and have a job, have a, a way of making money and to pay back the government. And this was the only one that everybody paid, the government was, wow, a government project that got paid back. <laughs> so do you think it was successful? Oh, I, that sounds successful to me. <laughs> Out of 100 homesteads in the United States, the Taggarts Valley homesteaders paid their dues and were able to maintain the last surviving homestead school in America until 2016 when the roof was destroyed during a violent storm. The local board of education had identified the school as one that they could not continue to maintain and it was sold to the Taggarts Valley Homestead Association. Someone put a uh, rubber membrane roof on a section of it and over the years it has failed but um, it has allowed a lot of water to run into this building in one certain section of the building. The other section of the building is dry. Uh, kitchen and cafeteria area, the ceiling and the floor were damaged from the leaking roof but we're in the process of renovating this and we're going to have a new floor installed, we're going to have a new ceiling installed, and there's going to be a dividing wall installed to divide the kitchen from the cafeteria dining room area. And as you can see, this is the original tiny roof flooring here that's exposed now. It had particle board on top of it, and the youth build organization uh, came up and they worked really hard to remove all this particle board uh, clear back to almost halfway in the dining room area. The day the roof flew off, if I remember right and when I was looking at my pictures it was like late February, early March when, when it blew off and there had been some thunderstorms that had come through the area the day before, a couple days before. So. It wasn't like, oh my gosh, there's another storm that's going to come through. Um, they, there had been some kind of bad storms come through. Um, we were in here, and the stuff blew up on the window. We were on uh, recess, is what it was. And I was like, guys, get away from the windows. You could see stuff kind of blowing. And then so the next thing, something slammed up real hard against the window, and I said, out in the hallway. But we had kids lined up in the hallway after that roof blew off. They were lined all up through here and we fed them um, lunch because it was right about lunch, lunch time when it happened. And it got their mind off of what had just happened too. You, know, you could see that something had happened, but you couldn't see that it was actually on the, the cafeteria at the time. Huh. But it was... Yeah, they've repaired all that. So I guess this roof on the gymnasium blew over here to over top of the cafeteria and that vent hood, yep. hood vent. Yep. Uh, it's where the water really started coming in around and they just finished us up about two or three weeks ago. And so your classroom was... Yep, that one right there. The, the last one? The very last one. Well, of course it was sad. You know, that school was old, but it had lasted for so many years. And, and when I was a kid, it was old when I, was, when I went there in the 80s, but it was so well taken care of that I think it could have lasted for a long time. And our janitors really took care of that school, you know, and, and everyone who went there really took care of that school. And so I was really sad that the roof, that that happened to the roof. And I, I know that the levee, there's no levy in that county, and so they probably wouldn't have, I knew they probably wouldn't have the funds to do that. And of course, in that, in that economy, in that community, they probably wouldn't be able to just have the money right off to, to fix the school. But on the flip side, it's reassuring to know that there are enough people who care about that, that they're going to look for grants and raise funds to be able to hopefully fix it. You know, we need, we need uh, help from the public, you know. We need as many members and as many volunteers as we can possibly get. Uh, this is all about the community and to help the community and uh, to preserve the building, to preserve the legacy of the Tiger Valley Homestead. So uh, we, we welcome input from anyone and everyone in the area and we need volunteer help as much as possible.
The association is a group that is desperately trying to maintain the original purpose of the building as a place to foster education, civility, and democracy by restoring it to its original luster and using it as a community center for all in the valley to enjoy. There's a new day in view. There is gold in the blue. There is hope in the hearts of men. The world's on the way to a sunnier day, for the road is open again. There's an old half repair, there's a song in the air, it's the music of busy men. Every plow in the land meets a happier hand, cause the road is open again. There's an eagle blue in the White House too, on the shoulder our president there with a lusty call telling one and all brother do your share there's a new day in view there is gold in the blue there is hope in the hearts of men from the plain to the hill from the farm to the mill all the road is open again everybody sing it there. there's a new day in view there is gold there is hope in the hearts of men. All the world's on the way to a sunnier day. Comes a road in his open again. There's a note of repair. There's a song in the air. It's the music of his amen. Every flower. Let's give a cheer for Homestead Junior High. And it goes on from there. Shake down the thunder from the sky, whether the class be, whether the, whether the task be great or small, Homestead Junior High will win over all as our loyal team goes marching onward to victory. Rah, rah! I just think that, you know, the school's a very worthwhile thing to try to preserve for multitude of reasons, but historicals one, but community well-being. But I would like to see it, you know, become a community center, or, you know, be for the community, that they could have uh, things here again, you know, uh, plays or whatever they want to have. Uh, like I said, there used to be singing groups, and the magicians used to come here and put on shows at night, you know, and that kind of stuff, of course, that's kind of out of the picture anymore too, you know. Did, did Harry Donor have a garden? There wasn't anything. No, in the Harry Donor didn't have a garden. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Donor didn't even she, know how she to knows. use a hammer. <laughs> she could equate the earlier years of that kid with the principal. Well, we give him, we give him the nails and the wood to put new steps in up there, and they never did put them in. <laughs> if Eleanor Roosevelt hadn't put that in there this valley wouldn't be here. I mean, the valley would be here, but I mean... It wouldn't be the way it is. No. I have a niece that uh, lives in Memphis, Emma, 17. And so one day I got to thinking about all the changes. So I just sat down and I had two whole, but two and a half pages of printed out things, you know, that was happened when I was little. And I so sent it to her. And my daughter, she said, Mom, that is a treasure. She no, said, we read, she and her husband, and they have a son, too. And she said, we read over that, and she said, we laughed our heads off. Because it was hilarious, some of the things that, you it's know. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. But I think we had a better experience than most of the kids on the homestead.